Hi guys, uh, Liam from Lanterna here, and this is the very first of our iBiography videos, and I'm super excited to bring them to you. And um, if you guys don't know who I am, I just graduated from IB uh, a couple of years ago, just graduated from NSC with a degree in geography, and myself uh, and our team of tutors at Lanterna um, have created a number of, of um, materials I want to share with you guys today, and um, with regards to your IB geography exams, and preparing as well as you can for those exams, um, whenever they may be. Uh, and today we're going to talk about um, my favourite um, topic, that's Unit 1, Changing Population. So if you guys, you probably do know, this is your Paper 2, it's one of your core topics. Today I want to kind of lay the groundwork uh, and give you guys some of those key definitions, key ideas, key diagrams that we're going to be referring to throughout um, the paper and throughout that, that particular part of the course. Cool. Uh, without further ado, let's start with some definitions. Uh, and the key thing to remember about um, population change um, is it is it's affected by kind of two main things. If we park migration for a side, immigration, emigration for, for a moment, um, it's fundamentally dependent on the number of births and also the number of deaths. Okay, so in terms of, of birth, the first um, definition okay, we need to, to be aware of is crude birth, right? And how we measure that okay, is the number of births per 1,000 of a population. Uh, and this tends to be um, kind of double figures this on, on kind of average for, for a country, can be higher, can of course be lower but we're, we're kind of measuring uh, the number of births per 1,000 of a population. Fertility rate is slightly different. Again, it's per 1,000, but this time it's per 1,000 women aged 15 to 49. The number of live births, okay, children who survive birth, um, per 1,000 women aged 15 to 49. And, and the reason we, we uh, distinguish between the age of women is because 15 to 49 tends to be the childbearing age. Okay, For this definition, that's where we are kind of assuming. If you're between the ages of 15 to 49, it is possible for you to bear a child. Total fertility rate um, is something a lot of students kind of get stuck on. It is, re of course, re referring to fertility, but this is the more traditional uh, measurement we might have in mind when we think about fertility. Okay, And that's the number of children a woman is expected to have in her lifetime. So that could be 2.2, this could be 4.5. Okay, this is just the average number of children a, a woman in a particular country is expected to have on average in their lifetime. Uh, and the uh, replacement level to level of fertility rate is the total fertility rate to kind of replace that population, to replenish it and maintain its size. So ignoring kind of a migration for the moment, we need a total fertility rate of 2.12 to ensure the population size stays constant. That's just to replace, again, okay, there's two, you know, a mother and a father, two children each, just a little bit more. Again, okay, that's accounted for those variables uh, beyond our control, but 2.12 is that replacement level fertility rate. And that's a question that comes up fairly frequently, actually, in a, in a short answer question. Um, define what the replacement level fertility rate is. You'd first be referring to what the total fertility rate is and then make, kind of mentioning that 2.12 is the number of children each woman needs to have in a country to ensure the population size is maintained. Let's move on. Let's talk about mortality. Okay, so mortality being deaths, we start off with crude death rate. And this is much the same um, as uh, the crude birth rate in terms of how we're measuring it. Okay, so um, I'll move my face out of the way. That's the number of deaths per 1,000 of a population. We have two different types of kind of mortality rates beyond that. We talk about infant mortality rates and child mortality rates. Um, an infant is defined as somebody who's under the age of one. The infant mortality rate, therefore, is the number of deaths of infants below the age of one, okay, or infants just generally, per 1,000 live births. Okay, so we're just changing the framework of that, um, of that definition. Instead of it being per 1,000 of the population, it's per 1,000 live births. Similarly, um, for child mortality rate, a child is defined as someone under the age of five, and this is the number of deaths of children under five years old per 1,000 children under the age of five. Again, just mention, kind of making sure that our measurement is directly relevant to what we are trying to find out. And then we can find out um, population growth by this thing called natural increase, which is just birth rate minus death rate. Okay, and that, dis that kind of difference will give us an indication of how much the population is fluctuating year on year. Um, I hope this makes sense. It should be super simple for you guys. Again, I know it's a lot of definitions, but as soon as we kind of understand them, we can move on and talk about some of those more interesting topics a little bit later. Uh, life expectancy is the last one I want to mention. Um, that's the average age someone is expected to live when they are born. So based on um, those, th those factors that affect fertility and also mortality, we have an average age that a person in a country is expected to live when they are born. Okay, and I think in the United Kingdom, it's something like 77. Um, I know in, in Japan it's slightly higher and might be in the 80s even now. Okay, that's based on those different um, 
and estimations that we've been making over the years based on birth, mortality, health, education. Uh, and now I want to kind of go into some of those more detailed um, examples of factors or consequences um, that might influence okay, our birth rate and also our death rate. So let's start off with factors that affect uh, fertility. And the first one is just demography. Okay, maybe you guys are thinking, how can that be relevant? Uh, it's, it's acutely relevant when we're thinking about infant mortality, child mortality. And in a lot of countries which have a very high fertility rate, okay, there is this incidence of trying to compensate, so to speak. Okay, so if you have a child and it dies below the age of one or five, you're probably likely, okay, in, in a number of communities, to try and have another child. Okay, so when you have that high infant mortality rate, a couple of years ago it was around 10% in Gambia, and there's a likelihood you might have another child okay, to replace the one that you, you sadly lost. So that's how demography can actually affect demography, which is quite an interesting um, concept. Of course, though, there are a lot of um, economic factors that affect fertility as well. Okay, so the level of poverty. We're going to talk about, you know, the, the cost of labour versus the the, um, the use of a, of a young person um, to help um, agriculturally. But the level of poverty obviously has a massive um, impact on, on whether you can afford a child first and foremost, but whether you kind of need a child in terms of um, providing services, helping out the family and that kind of thing. So uh, also kind of crucially is, is, is contraception. Okay, so not only can you afford contraception, but is there a, a distribution of contraception within your community, within your, 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 your country? Okay, if you don't have contraception, how can you family plan? You're more likely to have a, a larger family if you can't use um, contraception as regularly as other communities. This is what I was kind of talking about, the economic and social value of kids. Are they an asset? Okay, can they work the land? Um, can they support the family? Or are they a burden? Okay, are they expensive? Do they, they um, provide some sort of service or, or, or do they, they fail? Okay, and, and when you weigh up those two, um, obviously it depends massively on the, the type of economy you're operating in. And that can influence whether a woman is likely to increase her total fertility rate okay, and choose to have more children or, or not. And of course, the nature of employment um, can undermine that. Okay, so you can, have a, you can want to have a massive family, um, but if you aren't given the maternity leave or, or the paternity leave, um, or the ability to take a step back from your role in, in a job to have a child and then go back at the same level, that really influences the, the decision to have children first and foremost at all, but also how many. Let's move on. Let's talk about the social kind of cultural um, impacts or the factors that affect um, fertility. Okay, the first is level of education. Okay, do you know about family planning? Okay, you're going to be able to access those, those well-paid jobs that don't mean you need to have um, a child. This is intimately linked to the social and economic status of women. Okay, if women are empowered um, to find those jobs, to, to, to work their way up um, professionally, okay, they might be less likely to, to um, have more children okay, because they have another role in society to fulfil. Again, contraception, I mentioned that earlier, that's critical. Okay, the provision of contraception is a massive kind of game changer to communities in terms of empowering women first and foremost, but also affecting fertility rates um, as well. Marriage patterns is something that um, I know a lot of students don't really talk about that much, uh, but how later are people getting married? The later they get married, the likelihood is they're going to be having less children, but also how you know widespread is polygamy? Okay, that's that's having multiple partners. Okay, how um, how kind of frowned upon is it is a child out of wedlock? Uh, of wedlock? And again, that's very much linked to this idea of religion. Some religions are um, quite stringent in terms of of um, um, the number of children you're able to have or when to have children etc but also on the provision of of contraceptions as well okay um pensions and support and, and healthcare as well that's all about first and foremost okay do we do we need a child to, to care for a family do we need more children to be able to support and um, that family structure but also in terms of healthcare okay how good is the um the uh, maternal health care when a woman is having a child is she likely to survive is is the child likely to, likely to survive that feeds back into that demographic point i made at the beginning and the final thing in terms of kind of social cultural is um, prestige okay and what i mean by this is like how much power is derived in a community by the size of a family um, and, and and in a number of cases in, in in a few tribal communities i know i i studied a few university there is a widespread um um Kind of like power dynamic that is derived from the size of a family and the more children a family has okay the more powerful they tend to be in that local community and that can really affect um fertility rates in that area finally um it's the politics and this is going to be a whole different 
um, episode. I'm really excited about it because it's one of my favourite topics as well. We're looking at how can governments kind of manage populations? How can governments try and convince people to have less children or have more children? And that's all about these natalist policies, pro-natalist policies and anti-natalist policies. And we're going to cover them a little bit later on. Uh, the second thing um, is obviously our death rates. How can we affect our death rates? What are the factors that actually influence death rates um, across societies? So what can cause high death rates? Well, first and foremost, of course, poor health care. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, when there's disease, okay, do they have uh, doctors available? Do they have medicines available? Yeah, but beyond that, are you able to um, provide vaccinations? Okay, provide good health care provide clean water all of these things okay kind of build on each other to create a society where death rates are likely to be higher okay can you can you cure common diseases do you have access to hospitals are there enough doctors to see you and um, these are massive things and they're not just issues in ledcs okay but they're also issues in terms of um overstretching um, resources in some of those more economically developed countries as well malnutrition okay that can obviously cause high death rates that's getting the wrong um you know, not enough first and foremost, so um, starvation is, is a type of malnutrition, but maybe you're getting the wrong type of nutrition as well. So obesity falls into that, you're not getting enough of those healthy foods, your um, diet is made up of a, of a certain type of nutrient, which isn't beneficial to your health overall. War obviously has a massive impact, um, as well as natural disasters uh, and demanding jobs. Okay, what I mean by demanding jobs is you might be working a job um, with, where the conditions are, are fairly unhealthy, okay, you might be um, at the mercy of air pollution, in fact, as I record this, uh, we have the coronavirus um, crisis. I read an amazing statistic about um, China and the fact that they've actually shut a lot of those factories due to the crisis. And it's, it's uh, estimated to save about 50,000 lives um, that would have been lost due to the air pollution caused by factories. Okay, so clearly the type of job we are um, or, or how the economy is um, constituted in a country has a big impact on death rates too. In terms of causing lower death rates or reducing death rates, um, it's kind of almost the opposite. Okay, so we can kind of work it out ourselves. We've got better healthcare. First and foremost, access to healthcare is better. More doctors, more medicines, possible vaccinations for a lot of those curable diseases and um, that weren't available before. Cleaner water supply, better sanitation, so better provision first and foremost of that clean water, but of showers, soaps, and um, those sorts of things too. And then obviously healthy and nutritious diets as well. Um, and, and, and exercise is, is obviously important to make sure that we have um, uh, the ability to um, synthesize those those uh, those uh, nutrients, but also maintain um, a healthy weight, which is obviously important in terms of uh, feeling better and not being so susceptible to certain types of diseases, certain types of cardiovascular diseases in particular. Cool. I'm going to leave this episode here and there's going to be a part two in a second where we're going to be talking about the demographic transition model and then population pyramids. OK, so uh, click on the next video and I'll see you there in a sec.